uh, welcome to the second annual Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture. Um, this is put on by the George Washington University and specifically the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. And I welcome you on behalf of our leadership, Dean Michael Foyer, our academic Dean, uh, Colin Green, uh, as well as all of our faculty, students and staff uh, who have all pitched in uh, to put on uh, this event uh, today. Uh, a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you to our leadership, uh, Dean Foyer and Dean Green for your continued support of our uh, DIEI, some say J-E-D-E-I efforts. Uh, it is truly an honor and a privilege to work at a place uh, that puts uh, diversity and equity and inclusion so high up on a priority. I would like to thank uh, the department which is putting on this lecture, which happens to be my department, the Department of Educational Leadership, uh, led uh, of course by our chairman, Dr. Natalie uh, Millman. And thank you to uh, the Office of Diversity and Community Engagement here at GW, as well as uh, the Multicultural Student Center under the direction of uh, Director Michael Tapscott, who has been a partner at this event since its inception uh, about two years ago. Uh, we thank you for your partnership. We know that this event will not go on without you. And if you're here tonight, we welcome you as well. So what is this event about? We have a dual purpose tonight. The first purpose, uh, of course, is to honor the legacy, the tradition, and the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. As we are a research university with a research mission, we have decided to honor that legacy by selecting a young pre-tenure faculty member and highlighting their in-progress work matching that work with a more senior member to respond and then open it up to the community, our friends, our family, uh, to give us feedback on that work uh, so that young scholar uh, could take that work and reach to uh, publication. Um, tonight's speaker is Dr. Denise Dorch, uh, someone who is uh, new, uh, sort of, uh, to GSHED. And if anyone has taken Dr. Dorch's excellent class, you know that she probably has uh, all types of quotes ready for you. Um, so I, I won't bore you with too many because I know she has that covered. But as this is the MLK lecture, I want to give you two. The first is from the letter to Birmingham Jail, uh, which is often quoted as an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I want you to hold that. And I want to get you another quote from Dr. King's book. And the quote goes, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Challenge and controversy. We are here today sitting in a nation in times of challenge and controversy, times where injustices plague us throughout our society and call upon us uh, to take stands stands that might not necessarily be comfortable, might not be convenient, but stands that are necessary and need to be taken. There are still injustices where we live in a society where some women make 75 cents for a dollar for the same work that a man will do. There are still injustices where regardless of what party you vote for, uh, the vote and the right to vote is being challenged here today. There are still injustices where students, whether that be K through 12, whether that be in higher ed or in post-secondary and graduate work are in classes where they're experiencing violence, some physical, and as you will hear today, some psychological. There are still injustices that need to be fought. And this is GSED's answer to fighting that, to highlight work that's going on those injustices. A few ground rules for tonight. The order of the show will run as follows. Uh, after my introduction, we'll turn it over to Dr. George for her lecture. That would run about 30, 35 minutes, give or take. And then we will have a response uh, from our esteemed, distinguished respondent, Laura Engel. And then we'll open up to you for your questions, your comments, your constructive criticism to push this work forward. Please note, as a research university, our main mission is research. And this is pre-published research that we would like to fix, to mend, to throw accolades to, and push towards publication. 
For that reason, we will engage you in the chat function. You can send a direct message to myself, Meg Holland, or Victoria, or at the appropriate time, if you would like to speak your question to Dr. Dorch, we will unmute you for that. Uh, please know that while the George Washington University welcomes all, and this is open to the public, we have rather zero tolerance for disruptive behavior. Yes, please do engage critically with uh, the lecturer's work. And if you disagree or if you take issue with either the methodology or the results, we would like to hear that. However, we will not tolerate anyone that has come to this event to seek to disrupt or somehow taint the legacy of Martin Luther King. And if you do engage in that activity, unfortunately, we don't don't want to, but we will remove you. All right. So my brothers and sisters, uh, now that that is uh, stated, I think we're about to hear uh, from Dr. Dorch. And if you don't mind, um, she's done so much. If I could just read her introduction, I would really appreciate that. Dr. Denise Dorch's research uh, and teaching grapples with systemic oppression across multiple axes. She uses critical phenomenological approaches to understanding how African-American undergraduate and graduate students experience and respond to race and racism at predominantly white institutions of higher education. Dr. George studies the socialization of undergraduate and uh, graduate students of color. She is especially interested in how psychological violence and fear is experienced, manifested, and reproduced in the academy. Her most recent projects explore interracial relationships, racial agency, and their effects on the persistence in higher education. Dr. Dorch's publications address topics of the self-efficiency of graduate students and a sense of belonging of undergraduate students of color at predominantly white institutions. Prior to joining the faculty at the George Washington University, Dr. Dorch was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Utah, OUs. She created the African American Doctoral Scholars Initiative, a comprehensive mentoring program focused on graduate student socialization into the academy. Wait, wait, there's more. A formal program director at Texas A&M Go Aggies. Dr. Dorch also co-founded Sister to Sister, a co-curricular leadership development program designed to foster a sense of connectiveness amongst Black female college athletes. Uh, Dr. Dorch is uh, returned from the Peace Corps, where she served in both Morocco and Jamaica, big up Jamaica. She uh, earned her PhD in higher and post-secondary educational leadership from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a master's in higher education and post-secondary education from the Teachers College, which is part of Columbia University, a master's in intercultural service leadership and management from the School for International Training in Vermont, and a BA from Eastern Michigan University. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, my friend, Dr. Denise Dorch. Thank you for giving this lecture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wright, for that introduction. Um, I am happy to be presenting my scholarship today. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Um, but before I begin, I want to take a moment to reach out to um, thank my research assistant, Melanie Pagan, for without whom this presentation uh, would not be happening today. So thank you so much uh, for your help. Um, best decision I ever made was working with you. So thank you so much. Okay, so um, the way that this presentation will go is um, first I'll do a brief introduction and how, what grounds me into this work. We'll talk about the research, um, the literature, and what people say in the field about this subject, um, the theories that um, sort of help me understand um, how to address um, the scholarship. I'll talk a little bit about the way that I collected the data. Um, we'll go over the findings, which is how um, the participants explain to me um, how they're experiencing psychological violence. We'll have a discussion on that and then I'll give some recommendations and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Engel for her response. So the title of the presentation was Examining the Master's House. And so that's taken from an Audrey Lord quote. And so she says, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So what does it mean when the tools of a racist academy are used to examine the fruits of that same academy? Well, it means that the only the narrowest uh, parameters of change are possible and allowable. And she says that they may allow us to temporarily beat the master at his own game. 
but it'll never enable us to bring about genuine change. And so this fact is only um, threatening to those of us who still uh, define the master's house as our only source of support. And so that's really important. As a scholar myself, who's inside academe, who's critiquing um, academia itself, through the experiences and through the lenses of these African-American students. So uh, first off, what's psychological abuse? Um, and so if we look in media, there's been some instances um, about what abuse is. And so abuse itself is any type of behavior that's like mental or physical that one person does to another to cause harm. So psychological abuse would be um, verbal or mental abuse that's intended to damage, um, to tended to cause damage by undermining a person's well-being or their self-esteem or their mental health. And so here, um, there are instances, so for the past 30 years, for example, um, scholars have discussed ethical issues in graduate education. Um, and despite these ethical issues have included racial, gender discrimination, workplace incivility, bullying, mobbing, harassment, academic theft, neglect, scholars having argued over the role of graduate programs to be more equitable, more autonomous, more collegial, more helpful, more rigorous, more just. But in the, in the midst of that, we still have, um, we still have unsavory behavior um, that folks will call unsavory or unseemly behavior that's happening, right? But in recent years, there's been more attention being paid to the complex and power laden relationship that exists between faculty and graduate students in the academy. Um, specifically when it comes to publications, which are considered academic currency, and therefore plagiarism, like stealing people's work, and uh, the misappropriation of student work, and is considered academic honesty and thievery. Um, um, and nevertheless, harassing students, for example, or creating um, unsafe or highly sexualized environments, um, suppressing student agency, faculty incivility among peers or graduate students, belittlement, punishment, um, those managerial misconduct and exclusion are simply argued as bad behavior um, rather than being described as psychologically violent. Even benign neglect or malfeasance is mischaracterized as just misbehaving. And so uh, we have a responsibility to sort of consider these things as we look at new forms of emotional abuse and essentially abuse is violent. And so for faculty who claim to be advocates of students of color, for example, may exhibit neglect by taking on a cavalier approach uh, to, to providing them with proper guidance and instruction. Um, and so the outcomes from a study like mine, for example, could assist us in institutions in transmogrifying our socialization processes. Um, and further, what psychological violence and its forms um, could have are major implications for graduate education and our understanding of the graduate experience. So the research focus here, um, while it can be argued that many students across ethnic groups may experience psychological violence, uh, racism essentially magnifies and complicates uh, this experience due to systematic alienation, racialized trauma, um, isolation, and other racialized stressors experienced by African-American students in graduate school. Um, African-American doctoral students make up about 6% which is a really small percentage of overall doctoral degree recipients. So if you take even in 2020, there were about 55,000 um, folks who graduated with doctoral degrees. Out of that 55,000, um, there were only about 24, 2,500 that graduated. And that number has remained pretty stagnant for the last 20 years. There's been very little there's been very little movement when it comes to African-Americans um, obtaining doctoral degrees, given that there's been so many undergraduate students um, over the recent years that have successfully completed their programs. And so it makes you wonder what's happening at the doctoral level where um, there isn't, there hasn't been such an increase. And so it caused me to really think about um, 
what's happening for graduate students, um, given that um, doctoral students become professors, they're the ones who become the doctors, they're the MD PhDs. And so um, there, we're not um, increasing in those fields. So the research focus is about how African-American doctoral students are essentially experiencing psychological violence. And so um, when I looked at the work that's out there, what are people saying? So I looked at academic violence and some of that was exhibited through some of the pop culture media um, um, slides that you had just seen earlier, the titles of um, what's happened um, for students in whether it's faculty misconduct or different violence. And then the ways that African-American students are being socialized into the academy. I also looked at um, um, their ethical environments. And so there's a lot of studies that show um, a large percentage of people who reported psychological abuse um, um, from an adult um, when they were a child. And psychological abuse can have all kinds of characteristics. It could look like an attack um, on a victim's character. It could be yelling obscenities. It could be using curse words, offensive language, negative tones, talking to someone in a demeaning fashion. It could be exploiting someone, victim singling somebody out, embarrassing them, excessive teasing, mockery, eye rolling, joking, harmful threats, uh, the silent treatment, avoiding any contact with them, gaslighting, telling the victim that their memory is false or that something hasn't happened. And so I looked at um, all the sort of literature that talked about these things, also including like spiteful comments or um, when I looked at African-American student socialization, I also looked at um, how they went from novice scholar to senior scholar, but also looking at racism and tokenism and campus climate literature and the mundane everyday environmental stress that African-Americans experience, that they're hyper surveilled. And so research exists out there that talks about all of these things, but rarely do they say it's psychologically violent, okay? So the theories that I use to um, help me understand, to situate this work, is I look at socialization theory. And that's essentially the process of learning and internalizing the cultural norms and behaviors of a place and incorporating it into your own identity. So essentially, that's the process from going from like a novice scholar to a senior scholar. So someone who doesn't know to someone who knows quite a bit. And so it, um, it happens in sort of three ways. And so first there's knowledge acquisition. And that's when you begin to understand the issues that are existing and you're operating in the stage learning about the rules of something, whether that's the rules of your department or your program or group, um, the university terminology, departmental norms, accepting um, a, a, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Your level of investment and that's your commitment to something. That's how, how much money you invest in something. That's how much time you dedicate to this thing. Um, that's when you start to think about your reputation as you prepare uh, for your doctoral study or your work. And then there's how much involvement do you have? Do you go to conferences? Do you, are you on teams? And this is the process in which students begin to make sense of the intersections of their personal identity and their professional identity, okay? So the research itself is, um, what I did is I looked at one uh, predominantly white Midwestern university, predominantly white research institution in the Midwest called Anthony Michael University. That is a pseudonym named after my brothers, Anthony and Michael. Um, shout out to them. Okay, and so um, that is the pseudonym. There are about 40,000 students at AMU, 2% were black. Um, at the time of the study, there were 1400 degree recipient, doctoral degree recipients, 25 of them are black. There's this uh, gender breakdown as a cisgender breakdown between uh, men and women. Um, and then um, and then you can see the other um, the other demographic of the racial groups um, uh, to the left of the pie chart. A little bit about the participants in the study that you'll um, hear their um, their narratives today is there were nine students and so, here, because there were very few of them in their programs and departments, I only talk about them across, um, across fields. So I don't specify like which program because that would inadvertently um, identify the students. 
And so you can see as you go down the list, you can see their names are on the left, their gender breakdown, the field that they were in, the type of undergraduate institution that they attended. PWI stands for predominantly white institution and whether that was in the Midwest or the East or the Northeast or a historically black college in the South or the South. Most of them were single at the time of the study, um, one of whom was married. Um, one of them had children and the rest did not. And then several of them were first generation college students, but not all of them. Three of them, as you can see, were not. So, um, so just a little bit more about them. The way that I went and conducted the study is I did this thing called hermeneutic phenomenology. And so the goal of phenomenology is to understand how someone's experiencing the world through storytelling. And so it recognizes that both the researcher and the subject are subjective and contextual. It seeks to understand and interpret the everyday experiences of people and try to uncover the meanings that people that of their experiences that may not be obvious. So what you'll see here is um, through the research, it was a year long study. I interviewed each person um, three times for 90 minutes each time over the course of an academic year. So I have quite um, a bit of data. And the first interview was all about their experiences growing up. The second interview was all about their day-to-day -day experiences as a doctoral student. And then the third interview was all about the sense making. How did, what does this mean to them and why are they doing this? So that's how I went about and collected the data. And then, so this is um, what they had to say. So when addressing the research question, how are African-American doctoral students experiencing psychological violence? I learned that they're experiencing it in a multitude of ways. Um, and so some of those ways are situational, ephemeral, and multifarious. And so I sought to capture their stories and retain as much of their vernacular as possible. So in a second, you'll see me read off to you some of their quotes. And you'll see, sometimes you'll see ums or likes or they may be stuttering or stammering, or you may even see moments where they sigh. All of that is intentional. And the reason why I do that is because um, it's important as another layer of analysis to um, analyze what, um, what you see and what you don't see. So nonverbal cues are as important as the verbal ones, okay? So just sort of keep that in mind. And so it may include moments of where participants are crying or laughing or sighing or stuttering. So, so um, just keep that in mind as you're reading the quotes, okay? So as a reminder, um, again, uh, what is psychological violence? And so it is. it includes confinement, isolation, verbal assault, humiliation, intimidation, infantilization, or any other treatment which may diminish the sense of identity, dignity, and self-worth. And so some examples of that um, identified by the participants are faculty members insinuating debt indebtedness, uh, student, uh, students uh, perpetuating racist ideas or making egregious statements in class, which may be ignored by faculty and others. It could be isolating, humiliating, dangerous or unsafe spaces endured by African-American students. It could be faculty members co-opting student work and taking sole credit. It could be students co-opting the work of other students. It could be acts dismissed as hazing or part of the socialization process. So here's the first example, insinuating indebtedness. So this is Taylor, doctoral student at the time. And she says, I had my first meeting with my advisor. She's a white Jewish woman. And um, we sat down in the meeting and she was like, oh, I'm excited that you're here. And she says, I'm probably not supposed to tell you this, but I actually pulled your application out of the reject pile. And so Taylor says, I felt like she was trying to build it up so that I needed her. Like you needed me because you need to be loyal to me because I got you here. I left the meeting and I cried and I cried and I went to my apartment and I cried. Like I, I called my mama and cried. I called my academic advisor from undergrad and cried. And after that moment, I created my escape plan, not from the university, but from her. Okay. And so that's an example, as you see in the yellow of, um, a faculty member setting it up so that a student would feel like you need me because I did this thing for you, okay? Here's an example of academic theft. Now here's Deshaun, um, and you'll see quite a bit from Deshaun, and Deshaun is the one who lays out um, psychological violence, and he says, I've heard 
from folks developing heart conditions because of the type of stress that their advisors put them under and their advisors taking credit for all that work. And that's violent because now this person's walking away with not just a heart condition, but feeling robbed because they didn't even get acknowledged in that way. Do better. And he says, and how cutthroat can that be? Like, like I've heard of folks situations of where people had their papers stolen, but you just hear about how folks have to be so protected and so guarded around this experience. And I think about what it's like for black grad students in like professional schools, okay? Another example of what it could look like is it could look like racial microaggressions. So Deshaun says here, like the condition of the training that I feel like I received, received here has been, you don't have a voice because I was the only black male in my cohort. I could see the look that I was given as I walked down the hall. Where, and so here I wanna highlight how facial expressions could also be considered violent. And he said, I would, I would see folks kind of respond to me like, what are you doing here? And Monica said, you know, I'm really well known in, in the school. She was in health sciences. And she said, but, um, but at first I'm gonna ask, you know, do you work here? And I was like, I'm a student here, thank you. And then I was like, what did that mean? You know, like, did she just think that because I was brown that I worked here and I wasn't a student? So little experiences like that, but also walking in school and no one, huh, this again, no one looks like you. It is exhausting. Okay, so that's another example. Here's another one, perpetuating racist ideas. Okay, so Asada says, white folks are here like, let's not damage them, let's not expose them, let's not have them talk about the things that they're already experiencing. Let's act like it doesn't exist. These people who have been studying theory forever from Anthony Michael University um, and education, and they're trying to tell me that their knowledge of theory outweighs my experience as a black woman. And then you have Ivy, who's also in the health sciences, who says, I think that sometimes if you're black and you're researching black things, sometimes you can get pigeonholed. Sometimes people will think that your research isn't valid. Because for whatever reason, if you're black and you research black people, it's not considered as valid. But if you're white and you research white people, then you're the real deal, you know? Another example here, um, is humiliating and derogatory comments. So let me just start off by saying a little bit more about Asada. So Asada was uh, in the field of humanities and Asada was pregnant at the time uh, with her sixth child, okay? So Asada was pregnant and uh, so she was like five months, maybe six months at the time. So she was showing, okay? So she was showing and um, the department chair said, Oh, Asada, we're going to invest in birth control for you. And then a student in another department said, mm, why don't you wear a ring to look more respectable? You know what people think? They'll think, um, they'll think differently if you, you know, you wore a wedding ring. And so Asada says, so if I was dishonest about my status, I'd probably be treated better. And then a black male colleague says, you know, I understand, you know, about you being pregnant because my sister who was on crack, um, you know, she was pregnant. She had five kids also. And so Asada's like, what the hell do I have to do with your crackhead sister? Um, and it's how we equate these things. It's um, so you just, you know, it's so just, or black women who are, they're just kind of treating me like a wooden door. Like, you know, like, I really want to associate with you. I, I, I don't really want to associate with you because you're the kind of trouble, this kind of troublemaking black girl, or we don't want that trouble being associated with us. So white women who are like, you're setting the feminist movement back however many years and black women who are like, can you please stop having these babies and not proving the stereotype and black men like, I don't really know what to do with this. So I'm gonna connect you to my crackhead sister. Um, or white women who are saying, you know, let's look more respectable. Let's play into the politics of respectability, which is not necessarily associated with feminism. So, you know, it's so all of these different things. And I'm at the intersection of all these different um, beliefs and the readings of my body and as a black woman and my choices. So I think it's not just not being black, it's, it's being black and sexuality represented through motherhood and it's how people are reading that. And so comments like this create a humiliating, psychologically damaging environment. So if you're somebody like Asada and you are getting it from left, right, front, back, center, it's like, it's humiliating. It's name calling, it's criticizing, it's all of these things which create a psychologically and violent environment. All right, so then lastly, what the other thing that could be considered psychological violence is structural isolation. 
So structural isolation for a lot of African-American students in the academy often functions like tokenism. So they're the one of few in their programs, departments. Uh, tokenism is the practice of perfunctory gestures toward racialized inclusion. Okay, And so for many of them, Carmen, who was a PhD student in engineering, she said, if you're looking around for other people who look like you, you're not going to find them. Robert, who was in the medical school, said as minority students in grad school in particular, in the medical school even more so, it's easy to really feel isolated when something goes on or where people have these sort of conflicts with our majority counterparts. And Ivy says, being the only one, being the only Black person at times gives me this feeling of like inadequacy, feelings of like the imposter syndrome. And then Monica says there, there's a lot of like loneliness that I experience being the only black person in a room full of white women trying to get my point across. So what makes this structural isolation violent? When you know that there are cultures uh, like African Americans, for example, that function, it's a collectivist culture that actually functions better together. But when you have a system that systematically isolates them anyway, even knowing that this group does better together, um, that is violent. So when you don't recruit them or retain them or support their collectivism, that is also violent. Okay, so again, I'm critiquing the and academia, not only as a former African-American doctoral student myself, but as an African-American faculty woman who is at a predominantly white institution inside of the academy, inside of the master's house, right? So from my perspective, there's sort of three major conclusions that can be drawn um, from this study. Uh, first, I think um, it's important to know that psychological violence is more than racial microaggressions. So psychological violence is existential, it's ontological, it is real. And so in my study, participants alluded um, to being apprehensive, or exhibiting some anxiety around sharing ideas with their faculty and advisors. They were afraid. Fear is both an emotion and an action and can be defined as being afraid of someone or something. And so that's likely to be unsafe or painful or threatening. And so fear for them was expressed explicitly um, in the study as they felt like if they confronted racist comments or they were perceived in any way other than pleasant, that their fellowships may be taken away or that their funding would be revoked or that funding would be revoked from future African-American students. And so racism within the academy produces cycles of violence experienced by the folks in the study. Um, and so um, it's really important to sort of keep that in mind. Psychological violence too, uh, number two, is uh, shapes student socialization. And so, um, African American students have to contend with dual roles. And so they have to contend not only with the challenges of academic rigor, but for them to struggle means to be socially isolated, to feel as though you have to go at it alone, to have little or to no academic guidance, uh, to speak your mind or to be afraid that if you do speak up that you'll be dismissed or was discarded, disregarded for opportunities to advance. Um, the participants reminded me that if they told their entire truth, about their racially, emotionally, and psychologically violent experiences, they were afraid that they would be found out. Um, and so this also um, is perpetuating this idea of this pedagogical practices of fear. Uh, students are taught to be afraid in psychologically violent environments because they may not be believed or they, be, they may be suffering from, they may suffer from gaslighting, which is essentially thinking that they're going crazy. Oh, or that other people may be negatively impacted um, by them exercising agency. Um, that didn't stop them, but it happens. And so third, psychological viol psychologically violent relationships are difficult to leave. So when someone, if someone's looking at the study and they're saying, okay, but African-American students are in a very privileged position, why don't they just leave? Because it's not that easy. When graduate students agree to work with individual faculty and faculty agree to take on students, it's a partnership that lasts for years and in many instances, well beyond the time of graduate school. When advisors take on students, they agree to educate them, socialize them into the academy, um, recommend them for jobs, um, help them to secure employment. And unfortunately, there are instances which students are neglected, overworked, underfunded, um, 
And there may be instances where students feel so indebted to faculty that they will allow racial microaggressions and impropriety and harassment to go unreported. So much so, in fact, I'm going to I'm going to show you um, two slides, and this is where I liken an emotionally abusive relationship, which you'll see in yellow, to an emotionally abusive relationship that exists in higher education. And this is from the perspective of the students, okay? So in yellow, it's just a traditional emotionally abusive relationship, and this in white is what it looks like for students. Okay. So while there are many ways that psychological violence is perpetuated, we have to consider the most precious of relationship, and that is the faculty-student relationship, which if we're not careful, essentially could be likened to an emotionally abusive relationship. So on the left, if we have intentionally frightening, that might look like intimidating students into thinking that nobody will take them if they switch advisors, and especially if that advisor is famous. Um, then fear that they will not receive food or the care that they need. What that might look like for a student is they think they may think that their funding will be diminished if they speak up or taken away. If it's failing to check allegations of abuse against them, um, graduate students, undergrad students, postdocs often find that they have nowhere to go. And while yes, institutions may have an ombudsperson, if you're in a powerless situation, cases of abuse and neglect go unreported. It could be a socially isolating individual, um, and that might look like tokenizing students to be the only woman in a male-dominated profession, to be the only person of color in an all-white space all the time, not being chosen to work on teams um, and in groups. It could also look like making derogatory um, or slanderous statements about an individual. And so for students that might be racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic, name the ism. And that could be experienced in class, out of class, walking down the street, on your team, teaching class, being in the academy. It could be withholding important information or delayed release. And so in the academy, um, information withheld from certain individuals in order to give other people access. And so sometimes that's limiting opportunities for, for, for professional development growth. It could be being overly familiar and disrespectful, right? And so that could be other gendered racial sexual comments, creating a highly sexualized environment, a hostile environment, engage in, engaging in bullying. It could be unreasonably ordering an individual around or treating them like a child. Last time I checked, the majority of graduate students are adults. Um, and so there's no need for that. And while some people's mentoring style might be to parent, their students using patronistic language is inappropriate um, and unwelcomed. And furthermore, having students conduct personal errands is also inappropriate, but it happens in these relationships. So here's five kind of important points that we should consider about psychological violence. And so we have to exist, acknowledge the duality that exists within academe. Um, so African-American doctoral students participate in a system that forces them to negotiate their own versions of psychological trauma to achieve a higher class status or to attain, attain cultural capital. We don't have another way to get a doctorate other than the current system that we're in. So this is what they have to do to go through this process to get uh, these degrees. Um, it's a part of a larger system of inequity and injustice that stems from systemic racism and psychological warfare. Feel free to ask me that in the Q&A. There are health implications that include racial data fatigue, diagnosed and undiagnosed disabilities as a result. Um, um, Deshaun mentioned earlier about students developing heart conditions, um, depression. There's all sorts of things that ended up happening as a result of being in these environments. The institutional environment thrives off of competition and capitalism, which essentially encourages violence. And when we look at like our reward system, which also promotes essentially um, encourages people to behave violently. Um, and so without dismantling systems of oppression, cycle, cycles of violence will continue in the academy. And so again, we have to acknowledge the duality that exists with, within the academe meaning that we can't dismantle the system from within the system because we benefit from it, we sustain it, and we perpetuate it at the same time. We can, however, disrupt the usual cycles of violence um, that exist. Uh, so that said, um, I have just a couple of recommendations so I have about a minute left. <laughs> and, that, um, and so first, uh, for institutions, I think it's important that we revamp, consider revamping policies to be more equity-minded. 
We could revise our curriculums to be more inclusive. Um, this could be institutionalized in learning cohorts, for example. Um, it could also be um, re, uh, reifying equity and just. We could restructure our tenure processes and other reward structures so that faculty don't subject students to unrealistic workloads or are compelled to perpetuate violence. We could also be transparent. We could be more transparent about expectations, rules, and norms of the academy. Why is it that the hidden rules for students or the hidden norms is that they're going to have to go at it alone or rely on their own peers? Um, and those are some of the things that students end up learning as a result of being in a racist academy, which is also a psychologically violent one. We have to create new models. And although we don't have any, we have to be able to create them. Um, and so thinking about new models of mentoring or advising that allows for holistic approaches, and then we can't be complicit. We have to remove power structures that allow for hidden curriculums. And I'll just end with a quote because that's how I do. <laughs> um, and so um, let me, AJ says, in the spirit of Dr. King, um, as I end this lecture and we're talking about psychological violence um, and speaking up and exercising agency, is that Dr. King said, Dr. King was not the patron saint of words that appease white, but in fact, a disruptor for good. May we be inspired by his legacy to take action that we leave this world better than we found it. Thank you. So I will now turn it over um, to Dr. King. Yes, so we have, well, first of all, let me just say amen. Amen. Amen, sister. Amen um, to everything that you just said. An interesting topic, a rigorous method, impactful findings, and resourceful recommendations. It's everything we like to see uh, coming out of uh, GSHED. Um, we'll now turn it over to Dr. Laurel Engel, who quite frankly asked me not to introduce her, but I will truncate the introduction a little bit, and I'll tell you why at the end. Uh, Dr. Laura Engel is an Associated Professor of International Education and International Affairs at the George Washington University, where she directs the International Education Program, the GW Global Education Lab, and serves as the co-chair of the GW UNESCO Chair in International Education for Development. Uh, previously, Dr. Engel was a research fellow at the University of Nottingham in the UK, working on two European Union funded research projects on education and social policy to advance inclusion and uh, cohesion. Her interests focus on global education policy trends in federal systems and national and cross-national studies of internationalization in education. Dr. Engel serves on the board of directors in the NEA Foundation is a Fulbright specialist and is a joint editor of the International Studies in Sociology of Education. Dr. Engel earned a PhD in Education Policy from the University of Illinois, Goat Fighting Alani, Al 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 is that how you say it, Laura? <laughs> and as someone that also graduated from the Big Ten, we don't let fellow Big Ten people go unintroduced. So Laura had to do the introduction. I turn it over to Professor Dr. Laura Engel for her response. Oh, thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, thank you very much. I have to quote someone, a University of Kentucky fan who once asked me, what's an Illini anyway? And we won't get into that, but I do appreciate your kind introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a great privilege and honor to speak tonight at the second annual Martin Luther King Lecture and serve as a respondent to my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Denise Storch's uh, brilliant lecture. Uh, before I get into the substance of comments, I have to join Dr. Wright and just say congratulations, Dr. Dorch. Everybody, please give her a virtual round of applause for a brilliant lecture this evening. Now, we all want to ask you questions and get into the, the Q&A, so I'll be brief in my comments. Dr. Dorch focuses our attention in important ways to the forms and implications of psychological violence that are embedded within institutions of higher education how they manifest, how they persist, how they're incentivized, how they're hidden, all is part of the academic socialization process that many of us have taken part in. And importantly, how they're experienced by students. Indeed, in reading the paper and listening to Dr. George this evening, 
the rich accounts provided by the study participants really give us a devastating picture of how institutions, including those drumming the beat of diversity, equity, and inclusion can be perpetuating harm and fatiguing the very individuals they say that they welcome. Much of my own work is rooted in international education policy studies and sociology. And from a policy sociology lens, I study global education policy reforms and how they manifest in different systems. And from more of a sociological perspective, there have been different traditions in how education and its role in the social world are studied, and which I think are important for tonight's lecture, they frame socialization processes differently. So following the work of Rachel Brooks, a colleague in the UK, we can camp or organize the different ways we study education as either belonging to a consensus or conflict tradition. Very briefly, the consensus tradition, you can think of early classics like Talcott Parsons or Emil Durkheim, includes an approach to the study of education that tries to illuminate ways that education preserves society. It builds commonalities, it builds social cohesion. And in this tradition, socialization processes are approached to look at how students are brought together with again, attention to this sort of cohesive glue within the system. In contrast, the conflict tradition, thinking here more of Pierre Bourdieu, is an approach to the study of education anchored more in deciphering the power dynamics of play that yield and exacerbate differences and inequalities within societies. So in this tradition, socialization is much more about revealing and drawing our attention to cycles of social reproduction. And it's in this, in my mind, I see Dr. Dorch's work largely picking up some of the threads in sociology rooted more in the conflict tradition. In her study of higher education, as she orients us towards the socialization, of doctoral students within institutions and the reproductive structures of racial inequality at play within such institutions. We're able from this research to decipher power dynamics present within academic spaces and how again they're reproduced through socialization processes. Participant experiences suggest that um, in different ways how institutions are microcosms of the systems in which they're embedded. So one of our study participants, Deshaun, describes higher education in his program as a space he does not belong in. And he draws parallels to being in a state and in a society in which he does not belong. Later in the paper, he describes the cyclical nature of harmful racialized dynamics and how it feels not just to experience that lack of belonging, but to find oneself as an active participant in perpetuating it. And it's the cyclical or reproductive tendency that Deshaun and other participants are pointing to and the ways that they're socialized into academic spaces built on power, dependency, and hierarchy. As, as Dr. Dorch describes in her work, she's using the racialized experiences of African-American doctoral students to focus on a system that perpetuates psychological violence. And in the words from her paper, institutes a pedagogy of fear and forces people to self silence what I think, and this is more from a sociological perspective, is illuminating and important in the study is that it's not simply a focus on individual faculty action or lack of action or individual doctoral student experiences, though we do learn a lot about those experiences from the study. We're also learning about how systemic influences shape those behaviors, give rise to them, incentivize them, whether in more outright ways or in silence in and through these processes of academic socialization. And I saw parallels and advancements on the work of policy sociologists like Meg McGuire, who studied how harm and inequality persevere even within the context of educational reforms driven by equity and equality. And I think these perspectives are crucial as DEI becomes more widespread in institutions of higher education and as DEI becomes this sort of even nationally and globally circulating discourse in education, something that education must embrace. Because these perspectives that Dr. Dorch is bringing our attention to shed light on and ask us to consider how discourses of diversity, equity, and inclusion are situated against structural components that drive socialization patterns. So from the research, we get a chance to see into the social structures and social processes that unfortunately allow a lack of belonging, exclusion, and injustice to take root and grow. 
I wanna finish up my comments with what appears to be at stake as academic socialization processes are reproductive in these ways. In the discussion section of the paper, Dr. Dorch describes how most of the African-American doctoral students in this study were inclined to self-silence due to power-laden relationships. In the literature she's drawn from and from her own findings, there's evidence that African-American doctoral students leave programs, leave the academy altogether, that they experience negative impacts on their health and well-being. So in the wake of efforts to live out the ideals of institutions of higher education, dedicated to diversity of perspective, there's a loud and clear call to action. And Dr. Dort should be commended for drawing connections between her research findings and areas of institutional practice. So she's providing a roadmap, roadmap of considerations and needing changes. She's not just calling some of the academic socialization processes into question, but offer in ways that they might be rethought and reimagined. So I wanna end here, given our time, I'd emphasize that this isn't just about working in doctoral studies or higher ed research, it's about our entire institutional community, invoking principles of interconnectivity and mutuality that Dr. King championed in the letter of the, from the Birmingham jail. So here I'm gonna give you the rest of the paragraph that was started with Dr. Wright's introduction when he quoted injustice anywhere as a threat to justice everywhere. The next two lines of that paragraph read, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directs, uh, directly affects all indirectly. Thank you very much for the opportunity to respond. Dr. George, it's a pleasure to sit alongside you and, and learn from you and your research. Congratulations again. And I know we're all excited to get into the discussion portion of tonight. So thank you. Yes, yes, yes. And as I give a clap, uh, GW and our guest, if you can give a clap for those two wonderful presentations. Um, I've got a lot going on in my head. I got a lot to think about there. Thank you, Dr. Engel, and thank you, Dr. Dorch. And now let's